Some good people? As good as we get. Eighty-five is downhill. Rolling. I'm in both. Yes, sir. All right, Miles and Elaine Alexander, take one marker. Thank you very much. So Elaine. Yes. Tell us what about can the I? First time you saw Mimi Jackson. This is an experience that is really indelibly in my mind, and. At the age of 82, a lot is not in my mind that used to be in my mind, but it was a DeKalb County Democratic Party function, and it was 69, maybe 68, 69, early on. We went with a friend of ours who was in the legislature. At that time, we, li we did live in DeKalb County rather than the city. And I said to Elliot, who is that? man, that Cuban-looking, Oxford-sounding man who is taking up the whole room. He was just so big, everything about him, his voice, his stature, his size. And I remember that so vividly, and I remember the room being very small, but I don't think it could have been very small. I think it's just Maynard was so large. And Elliot told me who it was, and then, of course, saw him very, very often afterwards, and uh, I became involved in his campaign against Herman Talmadge. Uh, why, did you, why do you think he decided to run against Herman Talmadge? Because I don't think he knew he could ever win. Why do you think he ran against Herman Talmadge? Who are you asking? I don't want to He ran against Herman Talmadge to get name recognition. I had met Maynard when he worked at Legal Aid in Boulevard, and I, he used me as a senior lawyer advisor in terms of what he could do and not do in withdrawing from clients. When Elaine mentioned Elliot, that is a Congressman Elliot Levitis, who was a state legislator then and is a close friend of ours. But Maynard made it very clear that he wanted to get politically recognized, and there was a big anti-Talmadge vote. I voted against Talmadge for anybody he ran against, and Maynard knew he would have that vote. And he got almost a third of the vote with very little financial backing. When he ran against Talmadge, I had a client, Leela Ogden, who David Franklin approached to get a $3,000 registration fee to run against Talmadge. And Leela called me and said, did I know Maynard Jackson and should she lend the money? And I told her that he would be going far in Atlanta and I thought elsewhere as well. Uh, that. And I heard someone's cell phone VC. Uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. I don't know how much of that you got. We got it. I got it. We have two cameras. Okay, now I can interrupt him, I guess. Yeah. Okay, all right. You better wait till the camera's on, though. Mike and Elaine Alexander, take two. Miles and Elaine. Oh, Miles, sorry. Miles and Elaine Alexander, take two. Marker. Miles knew and appreciated the intellectual, rational side of Maynard because he connected with that. I connected with the idealistic, emotional side of Maynard. Maynard didn't like Herman Talmadge. I didn't like Herman Talmadge. And we thought that people deserve better, and there should be another voice. I'm, I'm speaking as a disenchanted activist, but um, I think that as much as Maynard wanted the name recognition and knew that he needed it and had a path that he wanted to follow, he also knew that the people deserved better than they were getting. Okay. You both came down here, you said, in 1957? No, I came 55. in 1940. I came in, I came in 1948 to go to college, and we were a suburb romance in New Hampshire in 51, and she came back with me in 55 after we were married. After we were married, of course, back then. Right. You had, you had to be married. Premarital sex back then was a French kiss. Right, right. 
and you had two years in the service. Two in years in the service and a year of teaching in Boston. Yeah. Um, and then we came back, started law practice. I'm still with the same firm. But both of you, either one of you can go first or together. What was Atlanta like in 1959? Atlanta was a delicious. In 1959, oh, I'm sorry. In 1959, Atlanta was what I considered a small city. I'm from Boston, and Atlanta was very touchable for me. I felt that for the first time in my life, I could be my own person. In Boston, growing up, the first question was always, who are your parents? What was your mother's maiden name? In Atlanta is where are you from? Because everybody was from different places. The, the people coming into Atlanta at that time were legion because they were from all over, came to Atlanta because we wanted to be here. And many of us wanted to make our mark. And there was room. When I came here in 1948, it was a streetcar segregated town. Uh, Emory did not take African Americans. My first year at Emory, the debate topic was resolved. Emory should admit Negroes to its graduate school. And I went out to Morehouse to talk to Dean neighbors out there. I couldn't, I was an army brat, could not believe Atlanta was still segregated because even the army in 1948 finally integrated. Um, in terms of the segregation, it, there were young African-American leaders who we became friendly with, like Vernon Jordan, and they would meet at a white restaurant every day with a group to be turned away and then go out and eat where they wanted to. Where they could. Well, and where they wanted to as well. Uh, so Atlanta, before the 1954 decision, the Brown decision, and I wrote my law school paper on that at Harvard, it, talking about the evasion methods. And when I said it would take 10 years for Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina and Mississippi to integrate, I was almost railroaded out of the class. And then 10 years later, I got apologies because it still had not integrated. But it was a very, very different city. Though what Elaine says is completely correct about blacks and whites. When I would go to Harvard or Yale or Columbia to or even Duke or, or Vanderbilt to interview, everybody wanted to come back to Atlanta who's from the South. And those who had gone to Southern schools wanted to come back to Atlanta. So the Atlanta firms would have more students and better students interviewing to come to Atlanta. If you draw a 500 mile radius around Atlanta, there's no competition. 500 miles outside of New York, you've got Boston, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Washington. Even Texas had San Antonio and Dallas and Houston. So we were a unique city drawing people from all over the country, the best of the brightest. Not just in law and accounting and architecture, but black and white activists that wanted to see a place that was improving and, and had some culture. And see change. Right. <laughs> so you guys meet Mamie Jackson in 60, 69, he loses against Herman Talmadge, then he becomes vice mayor. What was the role of a vice mayor before Mamie became a vice mayor in the city of Atlanta? Well, he was really president of city council for all practical purposes. In, in ter I'm sorry. When Atlanta, when, when Maynard became vice mayor, uh, and that was as directly as a result of the Talmadge election and the name recognition, he was a bigger, bigger than life figure, and he was badly needed by Sam Massell in that role because the African American community backing was important to get anything done, whether you wanted MARTA or whether you wanted airport improvements, whatever Atlanta needed had to have the support of the black and white community. And they were a great combination. And Sam Massell won. Uh, based upon what was really a, an anti-Jewish campaign. And the black community backed Sam because they understood what it was to be discriminated against. But when Maynard actually left 
the vice mayor's position or the president of city council's position. I think it was very hard for Sam to believe that Maynard was running against him because Sam had fully supported Maynard and Maynard had fully supported Sam in their earlier races. I interviewed Lonnie King a few months ago and he told me this story. I don't know if this is true. He said that there had been an agreement reached that Sam Vassell would not have run for a second term, that they were going to make room for a black person to run for mayor. And that then Sam Vassell reneged on that promise. I have never heard the story that Sam was not going to run. Um, I've known Lonnie King, who was in the same group that we were, and um, I, they, didn't, they didn't share as much with me as they did with the older, more established political operatives. Um, I, I think that Maynard's running for mayor was something that he wanted to do. Sam's anger at Maynard was something that was evidenced in one of the great political slaps in the face that I shall never forget. And I still have a hard time thinking of it. Part of Sam's campaign against Maynard was the tagline, Atlanta, a city too young to die. And I took that personally. <laughs> I was very active in Maynard's campaign and got to know and admire a number of people through that. And after we won, Maynard asked me to chair his inauguration. And I was young and stupid enough at that time to think there was nothing I couldn't do. So I just went barreling ahead in the inauguration plans. And um, that's when I found began to find out how little I knew. And that was evidence most clearly when um, Maynard decided that he wanted the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra to play and what he wanted them to play and his aunt, Matt Wilder Dobbs, to sing. And, um, oh golly, I can't, Please don't include this, cut this part. I'm trying to think. The song of the movement, and I'm, this is a senior moment. You shall overcome? No, Lift no. Lift every voice? What? Lift every voice. Lift every voice. And Maynard said to me, and Elaine, I want the end of the inauguration to be the audience standing and saying, Lift every voice. And I looked at him and I said, I've never heard of that song. It was interesting because Elaine it was a young beauty at that time and she was more African-American in appearance than her co-director of Leadership Atlanta who was Myrtle Davis. So people thought Elaine was African-American and she heard a lot more confidential conversations than I did. Uh, it was a very different time and where shared communications were sometimes filtered if you were not African-American or at that time. Almost God. always. Filtered. They're always filtered. Mm -hmm. uh, I interviewed Bill Clement yesterday. And, oh, yes. And he was saying that him and uh, David Franklin ponied up, gave some money to, to Maynard to start his campaign. But mm -hmm. one of the big concerns was from the, the African American elite, people like Jesse Hill, who weren't so excited about Maynard running for mayor. You, you going to talk to that, Miles? Well, Jesse and, and Herman Russell were old friends. and. They wanted him to pay his dues, Maynard to pay his dues first, and serve out the eight years as president of city council. I really don't believe uh, Sam ever planned on turning over the reins until the eight years was up. Uh, but I, I, again, that may be an inside story that I was not well, privy to. Not but I, but I was, I was counsel to Maynard through all of his years at pro bono counsel to him as vice mayor and also in his, six, his years as mayor, both his first two terms and his next term. And 
I think he would have shared that with me if it had been true. We were generally not outcasts, but we were resented by members of the Jewish community as Jews who were supporting an African-American candidate over a Jewish candidate. And it was my view at that time, and I think Elaine's as well, that it was time for African-American leadership to take the reins in Atlanta. And if Atlanta was going to move forward, it needed that recognition and feeling of participation. How was Maine able to persuade Jesse Hill and Helen Russell to support him? This was, I think that Herman and Jesse tried to talk Maine out of running. We were both on Maynard's first finance committee. Talmadge. And no, 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 I'm talking about for mayor, not the Talmadge but finance were, committee. Kennedy and you and I were the only three people at his first finance committee meeting for run against Talmadge. And Nobody else showed up. His, his first finance committee for mayoral mayor race. Also. Both Jesse and Herman were there. So they may have been against his running but once it was a fait accompli, they were on board, and they were very helpful. And the black ministers in town were falling all over themselves to get support for Maynard's candidacy and for Maynard. But you're absolutely right. Jesse and Herman were very concerned about offending the black, uh, the white uh, leaders who, it was less of a problem with Michelle than it would have been with a different white mayor. Right, right. So tell us, tell me, uh, tell me about the campaign, Maynard's campaign. How much were you able, guys able to raise? Did you help fund the campaign? You know, how long did it take for Maynard to really get a, a real head of steam up to know that he was going to really win this, win the, win the, win the race? Well, I was on the finance. I was not on the finance committee at the beginning, and I raised a lot of money from clients some of whom like to give cash, not because they didn't disclose it, because we made it very, I was counsel of the campaign, I made it very clear we would disclose all contributions. But I remember getting $20,000 in cash from the Pentecost brothers, and they wanted to hand it to Maynard to make the impression. And Maynard and I took the cash, went over to the bank immediately, got a money order for it and deposited it so there'd be a record for it. But Shirley put me on the finance committee when I started raising more money than the people on the finance committee. Because with a large law firm, clients want to hedge their bets. And a lot of very substantial white donors wanted to be early in the campaign. When he ran the second time, it was a lot easier because a lot of people that did not support him the first time wanted to make up for it. And Elaine has experience with one of those in particular. Who was that, Elaine? It was Silverman. Who? The, the uh, real estate contractor came to you after the first- Oh no, that was Shirley's campaign, not me. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. That was Shirley's campaign. You're right. He didn't give to Shirley the first time, but they, Elaine, Elaine. Oh, that was one of my very funny comments. This isn't part of the film, but. He came to me after being an ardent opponent of Shirley's and said, what can I do to get on her good side? And I said, grovel. Uh, <laughs> Elaine, Elaine shared, shared both of Shirley's, was one of the chairs of both of Shirley's campaign, first one with Andy Young. And, right. so, did you, but, so, so tell, tell me about the night of the inauguration. Did you get everybody to sing with every voice and sing? Oh, yes. I mean, and then I... I've well, only seen this on cover footage where he's really excited and happy. I didn't hear any singing. Well, his aunt was oh. there. She was magnificent. Oh, it, it was a fabulous... First of all, the swearing-in of the mayor of the city of Atlanta historically was on the steps of City Hall. It was the day after the election that, by the way, we never knew it was in the bag. We went around saying for the camp, all during the campaign, we're going to win this thing, we're going to win this thing. And I don't think anybody really thought we would, but it was all right because we were doing God's work. And um, the inauguration was pure Maynard Jackson. 
He knew exactly what he wanted. He knew how he wanted it done. And he knew where he wanted it done. He didn't want it done on the steps of City Hall. He wanted it done at the Atlanta Civic Center with the Atlanta Symphony and his aunt, the opera singer. He knew, he, so he had planned this. He had planned this during the campaign. So did you give out cheat sheets to lift up your voice to the audience? Yes, the words were printed on the back of the program. They were, and you well, know, you say that, the words to lift every voice and sing. To lift the words to lift every voice and sing were printed on the back of the program because I knew if I didn't know them, maybe one Caucasian there would know them, but no more. Not know those words. Like well, everybody sang it. <laughs> and um, it was a, just a wonderful, wonderful moment. People came from all over the country, and they were seated in the Atlantic Civic Center for the inauguration of Atlanta's first black mayor. And um, it, was, it was a thrilling, exciting moment of change. And I think I probably had the same set of emotions working that night that I had the night Barack Obama was elected. And unfortunately, not the same feelings no, when Trump was elected. Well, I would not imagine he would. So Sam himself stopped speaking to you after that? I stopped speaking to him. Oh, I stopped said. speaking to Sam. Sam was always civil, but never as friendly again, because I had worked in his campaign when he was elected, uh, and he could not believe that I had dropped out of it. Um, and Sam was a good mayor. Uh, he had a brother who was not very good that caused him a great deal of trouble because he would strong arm nightclubs and such to make contributions. And that may have cost him the election, actually. Oh, Sam. Sam, I think, cost himself the election. I don't think his brother Howard had a great deal to do with his losing. I think that... Um, Atlanta had changed, and Sam was still the buckhead boy he always was. Elaine is not a very forgiving person in terms of reviews of people who pose her. And I'm proud of that. So both of you give me individually your perspective on Maynard's first term as mayor. What were the, what were the pros and cons of Let, Maynard's first term as mayor? Maynard's first term of mayor brings to mind a story that's probably worth repeating. We were invited over to Buddy Jackson and Maynard's house because he was trying to recruit the leading chief of staff from the New York City government, Jules Sugarman. And he figured that Jules had not made up his mind to come to Atlanta from New York. So they had us over to tell Jules about the Jewish community in Atlanta and where his kids could go to school. The only problem was Jules was Catholic. So the whole first part of the luncheon was us telling him about the Jewish community. He had never told Maynard that he was Catholic. And, and then was, in the midst of this conversation, I said to Jules and his then wife, what I realized by then that they were not Jewish. I said, well, where do you want to be religiously affiliated? And they said, well, it really doesn't make too much difference to them. And I said, not a Jewish temple or synagogue? Why? We're not Jewish. And I thought Maynard was just, he, his mouth dropped open. Bunny started to laugh because it was funny. It really was. But I worked in Maynard's first administration. Um, I ended up assuming a title, because they didn't know what else to call me, as Special Projects Coordinator. And that meant all of the strange things. I started working at City Hall to plan the inauguration. I had my desk. I had all of my stuff there. I even brought a plant to put on my desk. And um, I just stayed on. And we decided it should be Special Projects Coordinator. So I saw things that happened in Maynard's first administration that still make my flesh crawl. He received, I am going to tell you, he received a telegram one day 
And Jerry Elda, who was his executive assistant, brought it into me, and she had tears streaming down her face. And she had handed me this Western Union telegram. I don't know if they still exist or not, but she handed me this piece of paper that said Western Union on the top. And it was the Camp Town races. It was do da, do da, do da all the day. And that was it. That was the message. Well, worse than that, you. People weren't returning his calls. People the... weren't returning his calls. People weren't taking his calls. So every now and then, Maynard would call me into his office and said, Elaine, I have to speak to so-and-so. Do you know them? Yes. So put in a call. This is Elaine Alexander calling so-and-so. Get on the phone. I say, hi, how are you? How's your wife? Just a minute. The mayor would like to speak to you. And that was the contact. But Maynard's first administration was noted for a couple of things. One is the fact that he really was seeking out the, some of the best and brightest people in the country. And when he had, when he made, and I think it was the first administration that Barry was airport commissioner, yeah. and he hired him away from Cousins. He went to New York for Sugarman. He, I think the police commission was a big problem, and he got... Eves, who I think did a good job, despite the trouble he got into later. Um, I still have a picture of you giving him a, an award at Urban League, but it, it was an administration in which the white community did not accept Maynard. Uh, he had, as his commissioner of uh, uh, urban affairs, he had Leon Eplin, who wanted to get rid of the cars downtown uh, and and stopped having more parking lots built because he knew the more parking lots, the more people would, would drive in. And there was a meeting at, uh, it was at, not at the trust company, I think it was the First National Bank of leaders that Mills Lane had pulled together to try to make peace between the African-American community, Maynard and, and the business community. And a group of us representing Maynard was there. It was an all-white group. And there was a pejorative used to start the meeting by somebody who was a senior partner in a major firm in Atlanta who did not realize that Maynard's representatives were there as well. And he said, well, let's start talking about how we get rid of this using the N-word from the mayor's office. And Mills Lane turned to him and said, Philip, you're at the wrong meeting. <laughs> and it, it was just very, very sad. But he had a lot of support by top people in the white community who were not of that ilk. Uh, it was interesting to see him bring in the airport with joint ventures under budget, on time. And nobody could ever take that contribution away from him. And he went out of the mayor's office poorer than he went in, which cannot be said for many of his other uh, office holders in that, of that ilk. How was he able to uh, make those joint ventures happen? Most of his contractors were white. How was he able to make Well, he, he initiated the, by, Maynard initiated the minority participation in the airport. He made it a condition in order to get a contract at the airport that they be a minority participant and that was true not just of ice cream parlors and, and Dobbs houses. It was true of the lawyers who took the bond, uh, were going to handle the bonds. Uh, he tried to do it. The only one place he was unsuccessful in doing it were uh, the auto rental places, Hertz and Avis, because 90% of the bookings came from out of state. And I had to go to him and explain we weren't going to be able to get it because they would pull out of the airport and have a remote site before they would give Atlanta a percentage of their rentals based upon their uh, total intake. Mm -hmm. But he was he was relentless, and he had had an office that minority compliance office that had to establish it. Our law firm was uh, participated with a minority uh, lawyer, and it, it helped in the sense that the lawyers learned how to do bond work. Uh, and the, the people who were participating in the subcontracts didn't have to have a bond to get the subcontract. That was what was stopping small African-American businesses. They were not bondable. And Maynard found a way around that. 
and an amazing number of architects, builders, contractors participated in the airport as minority participants. What was emotionally significant about that to me is the majority of the white community had never even thought about minority participation. It just was not on the radar screen. They hadn't thought about it. There were so many things that Maine had thought about and made public and people were talking about that just you scrape away all the garbage and there were the right things to do. Some of the minorities were had some humor to them uh, and, and were subject to some criticism. I think a very lucrative one was, it may have been predecessor to computer games, but uh, Mayor Hartsfield's wife, uh, Bunny, and I'm trying to remember the third participant. Abrams, wasn't it? Who? Who? Abrams. I'm not sure. I think it was Jane Abrams. But it, I thought it was three mayor's wives participated in, in this and, and won the bid, and people were wondering how that happened. But at least it was one white and two African Americans. That's okay. Anyway, the minority participation did have some friends involved. Uh, the head of Urban League, Lyndon Wade, had a shop there. The Dobbs, Pascal. Well, probably the biggest single aspect of the airport uh, that was different than any other airport in the United States at that time, they had a master lessor that leased all the sub leases in the airport, the, everything from uh, fast food to shoe shining to what have you. And the difference between Maynard's administration and Sam Massell's is the difference between true buddyism and true openness. Sam Massell granted four leases in the airport and those leases were all to political supporters. I'm sorry, I take that back. It was not Sam Massell. It was uh, Hartsfield, Hartsfield. And Sam Massell got stuck with it. So the, there was an Elson lease for all of the books and, and newspapers. Uh, Dobbs houses had all of the food. Um, Paradis had all of the uh, clothing and the toys. Um, so there were basically four, and, and Jacobs had all the drugs. They didn't have a florist. They didn't have a lot of things at the airport that under Maynard, Maynard opened the whole thing up, sent everything out for rebids, and to try to separate it from City Hall, he had a master leasing group that was a joint venture between Pascal's and Dobbs Pascal and Dobbs Houses. So Dobbs Pascal gave out all of the leases, everything from television to shoeshine to ice cream to what have you. It was still a lot of political pressure, but it, it separated and gave the city uh, some room to say, we are not involved in it, go see the master lessor. And I wish it were more effective than it had been because a number of people ended up being indicted out of that, uh, that had paid bribes uh, to one of the men in the Af not an African American, but a member of the Dobbs uh, House, uh, right? The the guy that there was a city councilman who was indicted, Buddy Folks. There was Jackson, uh, Ira Jackson was indicted and sentenced. Um, what's his name? Well, um, there was one person that got got off, and Mac Welburn. Mm -hmm. Mac Welburn did not, and we. I was Maynard made me asked me to be chair of the city license commission because there were threats made against some of the people on it if they did not vote the right way. Mm -hmm. And he figured by having establishment people on it, with me chairing it and a former police commissioner on it and somebody from the Southern Center, it would get cleaned up and we would have our meetings uh, every week at night at the police, uh, where the police station was located on Decatur Street. You know, from our conversation, I would like to use the airport 
as almost an icon. When I came to Atlanta for the first time as a resident in 1955, the Atlanta airport was a Quonset hut. It was a Quonset hut that is still, or was a few years ago, you still were there. You were in 1949, remember? I didn't fly. Yeah. Who flew yeah. then? Okay. <laughs> took the train. And, um, and it uh, is now a storehouse for co of Coca-Cola's planes. They, it's still there. But in the airport, there was one restaurant, a Dobbs House restaurant, and out in front of the restaurant was a thing of hay, a square thing of hay. Sitting on that thing of hay was an elderly African-American man and he just sat there all day long and said, y'all come in, y'all are welcome to come in. Come in and eat good Southern food. And I was so appalled by that. That was the airport. And of course, one, one runway. But that was the amenity in the airport. And then fast forward many years, I happened to be in a meeting of women, I can't remember what legislation we were trying to push through unsuccessfully, I'm sure, but uh, it was a women's luncheon meeting and somebody was called, I think it was probably half black and half white, somebody was called out by their office and she came back into the room and she said, I just heard from my office, the mayor is dead. And that was the day that Maynard dropped dead in the, in the Washington airport. And the first thing, one woman, an African-American woman, Anita, can't remember her last name right now, her first reaction was, and we haven't named anything for him. And now I think the Atlanta airport. Well, Maynard was a was really a cleanup mayor as well. He, he appointed a new ethics commission that stopped city council and other employees from getting mm -hmm. free tickets to everything and really uh, operating in a manner that had been done for years. And I chaired the ethics board and then was vice chair of it when we had Randall Thrower as chair, who was an iconic Republican. and. He, he sort of had a group that was above being pressured to do anything. And as a result, he was able to stop a lot of the misconduct that had gone on under uh, Hartsfield. Hartsfield and under Bissell. And the city council, which then had Bill Campbell on it before he was mayor, and Myrtle Davis, the city council uniformly rose up against these regulations saying, not realizing it was Maynard that was doing it and, and was having us do it, saying for 50 years, whites have gotten these fringe benefits. Now that we've got a black city council, it was half black and half white, they, they felt that it was being imposed upon them they because they were black. Mm -hmm. it, was it was a very different world at, at that point. I was interviewing Valerie, as I said to you, a little earlier before you both came. And I was asking her about, after Maynard's second term, he seemed to have a hard time in the city of Atlanta finding the kind of work that he wanted to find. From your perspective, was that yes or true or not? Uh, I was personally involved in it. It was completely true. There was no major white law firm that would offer him a position. Lawrence Ash and I, and I don't know whether you viewed, interviewed Lawrence, but he would be a very good person to interview on this. Lawrence Ash and <coughs> leading lawyer in Atlanta too. We had written every firm in Atlanta, including our own, uh, trying to get him a position. Now it's not unusual for a political figure to have a hard time getting a position because Governor Sanders couldn't get into the Lawyers Club when he finished his term you make a lot of political enemies and corporate enemies. The, the rationale, which I thought was a facade, 
was that each of these firms had clients that felt Maynard had hurt them while he was mayor because of his, some of his regulations. But it was completely racial in my mind. And he eventually was located with a Chicago law firm. And a number of the people that opposed him, in, including somebody in my firm who opposed him because of clients not wanting to deal with a firm that had Maynard as a partner, uh, recanted and did a mea culpa afterwards because Maynard was able to do something that none of the former white mayors could do. He could go to black mayors all over the country and get their ERISA work, their pension work, their labor work, uh, and bond work, and he became very successful. And he went out poor, but he, his background and his ability to understand what bonds could do for a city uh, made him a very successful lawyer after he started practice. I would love some, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Elaine. What? Oh, him or me. <coughs> oh. I've got the winter crud that half of Atlanta has had, but it hasn't been winter. Every five years for Miles Law School reunions, that's it for me. I have no family left in Boston. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. So children, you have children? Yeah. We have four married children and 11 grandchildren. No divorces in the family? All but our daughter, who lives in Washington. She's been with the State Department for all of the Clinton years and all of the Obama years, and now she's leaving government. Joyfully leaving government, leaving Washington. She says she doesn't. She's, she says she's not, not going to be responsible. I understand this is supposed to be 10 minutes. We can't say hello in 10 minutes. You rolling? Godspeed. Okay, go ahead. Call it. A little lower, by the way. Yeah, okay, okay go ahead. Call it. Uh, Miles and Elaine Alexander, uh, take three. Marker. Settle. second term, the Atlanta child murders happened. The issues of Reggie Eves and the scandal must have been a very difficult time. Did you have any confidential, close conversations with Maynard about those times, Miles? I did in terms of trying to get Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra to come here, and he was successful in doing so. And he was successful in having Frank Sinatra dry out for the performance because he tended to come and perform while he was under the influence. And Maynard got Sammy Davis Jr. and talked to me about the concern he had about it falling flat if it was a bad performance. And Davis, I understand, made it a condition of Frank Sinatra drying up to come there. And we went to it. It was a absolutely amazing performance uh, by both of them. Drying Amazed. out, not drying right, up. Right, 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 correct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But it, uh, and, and the, well, the Reginald Eves uh, situation is something that was very, very difficult for Maynard because he was a good friend. Yeah, I, wa I was not working in Maynard's administration at that time, but um, you go back, I go back to Miles' story about Jewel Sugarman and Maynard took great pleasure in introducing me to Reggie the first time when Reggie came in from Washington before he joined the administration and saying, now I've got something to surprise you with, Elaine. I said, what's that? He said, do you remember my surprise when you forced me to find out that Jewel was not Jewish? I said, yes. He looked at me and he said, well, Reggie is. <laughs> and, from, and from Boston, I think. Yeah. I've got a great picture of Elaine giving him the Urban League Award when she was chairing the Urban League dinner, um, which was not quite as valuable after Reggie left 
government is certainly important. certainly not to the urban lake. <laughs> so, Mom, I need you to set up the whole Sandy Davis Frank Sinatra coming to Atlanta. What precipitated that? What well, there was a mater felt there was a need for funds to support the family. Hold on a second, I'm sorry. Who's phone is phone? It was the Can children's murders. Oh. That that was the response yeah. that he was looking for. Okay. Sorry. When when there were when the unsolved murders of all the African American children in Atlanta, that was a period of great pressure for Maynard. And he obviously needed to do something to support the families while they were trying to identify and and prosecute the perpetrator. And Maynard had a group sitting around of to talk about what could be done. And uh, I was not part of the first group that discussed that, but he came to me in terms of talking about what could be done to make sure that all of the funds went to the cause that was intended, which were the parents. Because during Maynard's campaign, I headed a major fundraiser at a hotel where we, uh, got Aretha Franklin to come in and sing, and she, we had our supporters, and David Franklin said, they're all gonna do it without charge. But what happened was their entourage cost $120,000 to, to, to fly them yeah. in, get limousines, pick them up at the airport. We netted about 30,000 out of $150,000. So Mater and I were focused on not having a repeat of that and, and David Franklin was, of course, well-connected with entertainers, but I did not want to be involved in something where David was doing it free of charge except for the expenses. And we had an understanding that Sammy Davis and Frank Sinatra picked up all of their own expenses, which meant we netted a lot of money from it. And they did pick up them. They did. Uh, they did indeed. They did. And the reward was able to be a substantial award for information in finding. Is that the picture with Manny with all the money in front of him? That I no, 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 no. I have, but I can't even remember the genesis of the picture with the money. What was it? I, I can't. It was a reward for I thought it was too, but I yeah, I, I you was know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure it was the money for the reward to get people to come forward it's because cool. everybody knew that there was community information about the murder of the children, and um, they had to encourage the community to trickle up the information. You'll, you'll have to forgive me for not contradicting her, but we've been married 62 years. We would not make 63 if I contradicted her. So Manny, after two <coughs> terms, leaves office. Andy Young becomes mayor for two terms. Then Manny Jackson decides to come back. Why, Miles? Did it make sense? Well, I think it made sense for anybody Talk who has... what... Oh, I'm sorry. When Maynard came back after Andy's two-year terms in office, I think politicians cannot give up that type of attraction of being able to accomplish something you cannot accomplish in private law practice. You can do good things and not make money at it. I know that Valerie, unless I'm very mistaken did not want him to do that. I think that she understood his health was something that could not take that type of pressure for too long. And I think the reason he didn't run for a second term that, at that time was because Valerie recognized that. Maynard would lose a lot of weight before he ran for office, but he would then put it on slowly afterwards. I empathize with that because I tend to do the same thing. Uh, but I think he had some things that he wanted to accomplish and uh, on his agenda, and uh, and I think it was a very, very good time for Atlanta when he came back. What do you think, Gwen? Um, I agree with what Mal said about Maynard coming back for a second term, but the real the reality, I think, is power is an aphrodisiac. We all know that. I think Maynard missed being mayor. He missed the good parts of it. He missed the p 
power part of it and um, the constant aggravation and the structures that were put on him as mayor, things he could do and say as a private citizen that he could not do and say as the mayor of the city of Atlanta. I don't think he realized how deep that was. I think that Mater is probably the most iconic political figure in my lifetime in the state. You could not walk down the mm -hmm. street with him without people wanting to stop and touch him. You could not go into a restaurant or a private club without being interrupted every 60 seconds by somebody walking up. He had this magnetism that, that was sort of amazing to watch. You'd go in an elevator with him and he would humorously say, I've drawn you all here together today. And everybody would laugh, but it was, it was a way of diffusing that type of thing. But his third term as mayor, from what I've read, Gary Pomerantz's book and other research I've done, wasn't such an easy ride, it sounds like. I mean, it was a, it was a changing city, generationally, <laughs> economically, politically. What was the city that made it inherited in the third term? Well, it was different because the the city that Maine had inherited the third his, for his third term was different because I think people were lulled into a sense of security. When Maynard was first elected and when Andy was first elected, the city thought of new things. We were ready to get new things. And for Maynard's third term, there was, there was no ideal in the minds of the people of where we had to go because most of us felt we were there already. And um, Maynard was not the charismatic leader that he had been because the charisma had worn off. Maynard did not get the kind of negative press that he got. The thing that irked Maynard as much as anything else his first term, and we talked about it constantly, and I talked to people at the newspaper about it. If Maynard went to Dahlonega to meet somebody for lunch, the headline was, Mayor Jackson out of town. And it was just so grossly unfair. It was, um, it was a sad commentary, but I think the eight years of Maynard Jackson, the eight years of Andy Young, made Atlanta more realistic. We weren't expecting things from idols. We were expecting things from human beings. And Maynard, Maynard was very human, his third term. Yeah, I had a slightly different reaction to Maynard's third term. I thought he was able to do a lot of things that he had in his checklist. And he, he did not have the as strong a white opposition as he had before. And remember, it was, the, it was not the time of the Olympics, but he was critical. He and Andy Young mm -hmm. were both critical to the Olympics. Bill Campbell came in before they were held. But Maynard was still, in my mind, an iconic figure in Atlanta and worldwide, and between Andy's connection with African countries and Maynard's basically magnetism, which was more than Andy's in my opinion. Atlanta got the Olympics when, we were in Greece when Atlanta was awarded the Olympics. And uh, with, with our, we were with all the children, you know, we were just from another couple. And I remember the, everybody thought in 1996 the 100th anniversary, Greece would have the Olympics. And I remember seeing the newspaper with the three people on the stage getting the Olympic awards. Number two was this beautiful woman in a toga, which was Greece, which came in second. There was a wonderful Canadian mounted policeman on the third stand. And on the top, they had 
a farmer, a white farmer, with hayseed coming out of his mouth and coveralls at line of the winter. So for us to get the Olympics, I attribute directly to Maynard and Andy more than anybody else. And that was, I think, a culminating thing for him because he was a major force in obtaining the Olympics. So I've never looked at the last four years as a downer. I looked at it as a preview of continuing Atlanta's greatness. Okay. Well, it also seemed to be, I mean, you were talking about the fact that when he was the first term, the newspapers always said, Mayor Jackson was here, Mayor Jackson was out of town, Mayor Jackson. Now, in his third term, I know the Atlanta General Constitution, Doug Blackman, was doing a series of articles mm -hmm. looking for scandal yes. in his administration, which they did find. Right? The, the beer they, fest at the airport, they found some things, but made it never seem to get touched by the scandal, any of the scandal. Why, Miles? Well, I think he had the universe. Well, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think, I don't think Maynard was hurt by scandals because he had a very clean first two terms. When you go into the law practice afterwards and you start making money, then things become more hazy as to where the line should be drawn. But I believe he never lost the support of the African American community in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And he could do no wrong. He, he literally walked on water and I don't think anything was gonna hurt him. The only time I can recall where Maynard and I were on opposite ends of something, and Andy, was when John Young ran for office, and Andy and Maynard supported Julian Bond. John and Lewis, when John Lewis John ran. Lewis ran for office. And I felt that was a parallel to the Russell Hill wanting Macell in not to make waves. And I think Andy and Maynard thought that Julian Bond was a, an establishment, very articulate representative to go to Congress. And both of us supported John Young in that race. John Lewis. John Lewis, God. Just say John Lewis. 85 years old, and that's what happens to you. Just uh, say John that's Lewis. not all. Right. Say <laughs> John. <laughs> John. John Lewis became a good friend, and. Um, and we, there, there's a John Lewis and Major Jackson story that's also interesting. When our daughter was married, both Maynard and John were at the wedding, and some relative from Washington saw John Lewis and asked him to bring him a drink. So there's John Lewis in a tux walking over with a drink, and we see this, and our daughter sees it, and they go running after John's Paige and Steve were talking to these idiots. They were relatives of Steve's when John came up and gave this person the drink that she had ordered. And when Paige and Steve realized what had happened, they just went running after John. And this isn't about John, this is about Maynard. But uh, Maynard and John had a good laugh over that. And John said to Paige, you know, you see a black man in a tuxedo, what do they think? <laughs> And Maynard, right after that is where I was getting to, told me that every time he went to New York and wore this blue overcoat with a velvet front and, and, and walked out of a hotel, somebody would ask him to hail a cab. And it, it brought to John Lewis's story brought to mind, Maynard's telling me about being in front of the Waldorf and being asked to hail a cab. So when, when Maynard decided not to run for a fourth term, I was worried about his health too, so I thought Valerie was right in urging mm -hmm. him not to. I always assumed she was urging him not to. And it was a chance for him to, he was at the peak of his career for legal purposes. It was a chance for him to make some money for his family. Uh, and I think that he'd earned that. And he had not lost his gravitas in terms of impacting things. He, he, he had helped put Bill Campbell in office. He still had the Olympics Ahead of at that time. Well, once again, my reaction is a very personal and emotional one. I was pleased that Maynard decided not to run for a second consecutive term because 
I really felt that he didn't have the fire in his belly to make the changes and to do the things that he had when I knew him best in his first two terms. And um, I, I would have chosen someone else to run, but um, Not it was... Right. I'm, I'm a loyal Bill Campbell person, despite everything else. And I, I felt it was good for Maynard to recognize that 12 years was quite enough and he had another life to lead. So I reacted very personally to it. I don't know what the political implication should have been or would have been or could have been, but I was pleased for him because I thought he had made a brave decision not to run. And to go back to our earlier conversation about uh, scandals, you're a target, you've got a target on your back when you're mayor. When you're in private practice, that target leaves you and he had gone out, I think, of office on a high note, uh, not on a low note, and four more years just is playing with playing with fire because the mayor has so much power. I mean, he was had suits with the Coca-Cola company, had suits over whether or not he had a real estate investment. There were things that were happening that would not have not have happened if he was mayor. Maynard Jackson's legacy. I mean, there's, as you said earlier, Lynn, there, there is parallels to the trajectory of Maynard Jackson to Barack Obama. You know, the other thing that's phenomenal to me is that he becomes the first black mayor of a major southern city at a time in other urban centers. We had black mayors, you know, Thomas Bradley, Richard Hatcher, mm -hmm. Carl Stokes, Coleman Young. But of all of those cities, this city has had a series of black mayors since Mayor Jackson. What is his legacy, Elaine? I think Maynard's legacy, his all-time overall legacy, I'm going to use the title of one of President Obama's book, The Audacity of Hope. I think he was audacious. I think he knew things that should be done, knew they could be done, and really and truly believed that he could help to make it happen. And to me, that is Maynard's legacy. He was not only the first black mayor, but he was the first mayor to recognize problems, recognize just how unfair our society was to the African-American community. Highlight that, elaborate on it, and work to change. And that, I think, is Maynard's legacy. Wow. I have a hard time adding to that because I think Elaine has captured it. Being a lawyer, I tend to look at the bricks and mortar. I look at the airport. Atlanta has the busiest airport in the world. Who would ever think Atlanta would have more flights than Chicago, London, New York, Paris. That's Maynard. His minority participation, his being the initial very articulate mayor of a long line of African-American mayors who followed him, without exception, the most articulate series of mayors in the United States, in my opinion, one after the other, even Bill Campbell, who had some disgrace. Uh, it was formally practiced with our firm. I thought Bill was, because of integrating the schools in North Carolina when his father was a, in the postal office, Bill was comfortable with white people. He, he had some, some of the problems that many mayors have of uh, not being willing to deal with people who differ with you. Maynard did not suffer from that. He sort of welcomed people expressing themselves. He did what he wanted, but he didn't resent them and treat them as outcasts. And, and his inclusiveness, I think, was of white and black, of being mayor of all the people at a time when that was necessary in Atlanta is his legacy in my mind. Wendy?
Mm -hmm. Well, the funniest was the lunch at your house when Maynard found out Jules was not, Jules Sugarman was not Jewish. That probably was the funniest for me. Um, I'm trying to think of something. Well, when we had your dad to our house once, I'm sorry, you, you asked for remembrances oh. of, I was asked about remembrance of Maynard in an in informal, in informal setting that was not necessarily funny, but showed me something about his character that I'd never really seen before. There was a white couple that we wanted to support Maynard, who was very conservative. So we invited Maynard and, it was Bunny and Maynard, not Valerie, I think, mm -hmm. over to a house. And we had dinner and we sat around talking about philosophical things. <clears throat> and then we went down to play ping pong. And Maynard was the most competitive person I've ever seen at winning a relatively insignificant game against somebody whose support he was seeking. It made no difference to him that he was trying to get money from this person, but Maynard was gonna win that ping pong match no matter what happened, and he was a good ping pong player. I just thought of another very funny story about Maynard that I think is funny. He was at our house for supper when I was three of us after the four children were in bed and we were having supper in the kitchen and uh, Maynard asked for even more bread or potatoes. And I said, no, Maynard, you've had enough. And he looked at me and he said, are you sure you're Jewish? <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there's one story that I enjoyed about Maynard in terms of his national presence. <coughs> you, were, you were head of the mayor's conference under Maynard, wasn't, weren't you? When you had that immense affair at the Hyatt Hotel. Oh, that was the U.S. Conference of right. Mayors when I and was working And you had this immense him. amount of money to work with that, that you know, 20, 30, 40,000 dollars. I raised And you had the most elegant party that I've ever been to in Atlanta for the Conference of Mayors. You had a Spanish booth, you had an Italian booth, you had a Chinese. It was Atlanta, an international city. And Maynard could not believe that that could be put on with no city money at the time. But it was one of the more memorable dinners I've ever been to. And uh, it, was a, it, was just, it was just a very big function for a large convention. And then at the end of the conference, I had money left over and Instead of asking, like I should have, what does the mayor want done with this leftover money, I told him what I wanted to do with it. And that was I wanted to return to the donors, prorated, what wasn't spent in their don of their donation. And nobody had ever heard of that. Nobody had ever thought of that. And we did it. And that scored a lot of points. Thank you very much for your $50,000. We could not have put on the conference that we did without it, but here is a return of $8,700 that we had left over from that. So that was, I don't know if anybody else has ever done it, but he let me do it. He let me do it. Anything else? Ben Gurion, we were not in town when that happened. Ben Gurion, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Everybody, room tone. Everybody, say so. Sixty seconds of quiet for the ending.
Thank you very much. Thank you. We will.